Thank you. Do you hear me? So thank you, Sadis, for this fantastic introduction. It was actually one of the best ones I had. Uh, and actually, uh, I feel very privileged to be here because I'm sitting among so many great POTS doctors, POTS therapeuts like uh, Nick, Satish, Leslie, Morina. So I, I admire your work because you are so engaged when you... When you listen to your presentation, you see that you are so engaged, and this is exactly what we need, engagement in these patients. What patients need is our engagement, and, uh, and some science as well. So I'm going to talk about science as well, and uh, a little bit about recent reports on autoimmunity and how to treat these uh, bloody autoantibodies. So, uh, if they are there at all. So, you see... This, the verdict is yours at the end of the presentation, of course. So uh, this was the boring one. So about uh, autoimmunity. So there is quite simple definition of autoimmunity available, and this is everything which is related or caused any harm or damage caused by autoantibodies or T cells that attack molecules, cells or tissues of the organism producing them. This is that's why this is called auto antibodies, autoimmunity, or, or cells uh, uh, causing damage to your own uh, organs or vessels or uh, other cells as well. So the definition is quite simple, but if you look at the uh, composition of the immune system, there are some parts that are very important to understand to start talking about autoimmunity and treating autoimmunity. I'm not an immunologist, but this, these are basics. That everybody who's dealing with medicine should know the basics, actually, if the person in question wants to deal with autoimmunity. So we have innate immunity and adaptive immunity. And if you, if you look at this uh, diagram, you can see that at one point, the defense uh, against the intruder uh, switches from the non-specific response, general response, to the intruder into very specific response. The body is very surgical, it's trying to produce uh, molecules that attack the specific intruder to get rid of it. And these are antibodies, and these are cells attacking or living on the surface of uh, bacteria, viruses, and so on. And this part is very important if we talk about outer antibodies and pots. This is humoral immunity. B cells producing autoantibodies, which is, we're going to look at how they look, how big they are in a few minutes. And if you look at the uh, so called immune cascade, when the process starts with some uh, attack on the body, and you just look at the different uh, triggering factors viral infection, bacterial infection, like borreliosis, or injury. Do you recognize it? Actually, some POTS patients may identify an event, index event, that makes the whole process start. Usually some stress or some trauma, injury, viral infection, and so on. So it fits very well here. And this process, through innate, non-specific immune response, turns into very specific response, body-producing anti bodies against intruder, against something that we should get rid of, that doesn't have a passport. You know about passport, IHLA system? So everyone who wants to enter the body, like UK, have to, has to show the passport. So the cells have the passport as well. If they don't have the passport, they will get removed. So this is how the immune system works. And in the Temporal aspect, you see that the fully developed response, humoral response, starts about between two and four weeks from the index event. Do you recognize the pattern? Some of you may be dealing with patients. Some patients may identify the, when the process started. So, now moving from the basics about immunology into POTS field, 
If you look at the typical POTS patients, you see a lot of different symptoms, but there is one symptom which is common for all the POTS patients. This is this orthostatic, postural orthostatic tachycardia. Some people claim you don't have to have tachycardia to have POTS. I don't really buy it. You may have postural tachycardia without POTS as well. This is another story. But this, there is a wide spectrum of symptoms associated with pathognomonic postural tachycardia. It should be remembered, actually, at this point. So uh, many groups, many researchers uh, tried in the past to identify out antibodies using usually test kits that were available in the labs. The Schofield and other groups, they just use their skills having this test kit in the test lab in the hospital. They, oh, this, is, this looks like autoimmune disease, so let's check what's happening. Let's put blood samples into the incubator, whatever, and the machine, and let's see what happens. So they found actually a um, quite an impressive axis of different autoantibodies in POTS patients compared with the background population. You see a whole list. I will not go, I will not walk you through this list. You can find this, this list in this publication accidentally by, my, by myself. <laughs> so, but let's look at the first position, G-protein copper receptor. They are very interesting. All the other receptors may give you a glimpse about uh, autoimmune process in the body, but these specific receptors are special because they control the cardiovascular system. How do they do it? You see, this, these are these receptors, these specific receptors with uh, three loops sticking out and uh, with uh, seven protein helixes. So, uh, sitting in the membrane, cell membrane, and through these receptors, different effects are obtained through different substances, neurotransmitters in the body, like uh, uh, adrenaline, uh, epinephrine, norepinephrine, and so on, the uh, dopamine, and so on. But what if we do something with these receptors through antibodies? It may create some havoc in the body, chaos in the body. So this, is, this was the hypothesis. And actually, this hypothesis was tested by, first by a group uh, uh, from Oklahoma City, uh, Dave Kem. Uh, we had some collaboration, Satish and me, with this group. And they used, as a, you see, the two most popular systems for detecting autoantibodies. On your left side, ELISA system on the on your right side, uh, cell-based system. And if you look at the right side, you see the cell membrane, cells expressing, over-expressing specific receptors, just one receptor at a time. There's adrenergic receptor, alpha, beta, and so on. And you can put patient uh, serum or immunoglobulin, if you're lucky enough to uh, purify it, and you can see what's happening if the cells respond to the stimulation, not to the neurotransmitter, to autoantibodies. This is the system which is called cell-based assay. Now, this is what the group did. And uh, to understand how it works, it took me actually some time to understand how it works, because I was naive and novice in the very beginning as well. I'm a cardiologist. So if you look at epinephrine, clinching to the receptor, and you have out antibody, you see there is some difference in size. Can you see it? Is it a big difference in size? Actually, the difference is like that. This is the real difference. 1,000 times difference in size between neurotransmitter and antibody. A huge difference. And if you, to put it in a perspective, you can go to cinema in a few days to see it in the real perspective. You can see the rebel <laughs> spacecraft, the good guys, and the bad guys, Death Star. So the immunoglobulin is the bad guy. Oh, it's probably how it is in, in POTS as well. <laughs> so immunoglobulin G, outer antibody, is the bad guy, Death Star, and you have epinephrine, tiny, uh, 
tiny guys trying to counteract the effects of auto antibodies. So, you, you see the receptor, G-protein coupled receptors from above. So this is the cell surface. You see the uh, G-protein coupled receptors, three loops, thinking up, <coughs> popping up. And you see the, this tiny neurotransmitter in the middle. You see it? The purple one. You see it? Epinephrine. And then it comes. Death star comes. Huge. This is, these are the real proportions between neurotransmitters, epinephrine, and out antibodies. So it makes you think at once, probably there is only, there is, there's not only one effect, but there might be some other effects, so-called orthosteric, allosteric effects, stimulating, blocking, and inhibiting, and so on, in different directions, on different receptors. And actually, if you look at this study from uh, 2017, um, Satish, you were a co-author of this study, David Kemp, uh, our group, and Satish as well, you can see that alpha-1, beta-1, beta-2 receptors were stimulated in this cell-based assay by serum from POTS patients, but not the ones who had vasobagal syncope, recurrent vasobagal syncope, not the control ones. This, this is Swedish population. And it could be blocked by specific uh, blockers, receptor blockers. And even, even worse, these uh, out antibodies, they shifted the curve, the response curve, to natural neurotransmitter, to natural ligands. You understand what, what I mean? So you have epinephrine. Epinephrine cannot get to the receptor. It's being blocked. There's no effect. So you press the cardiac gospel and nothing happening. So it's like that. So um, these, are, these were adrenergic receptors, but there are other receptors that are built in a very similar way using almost the same components, like this one, angiotensin 2 type, uh, type 1 receptor. And this is a very similar receptor to adrenergic receptors. I didn't believe it in the very beginning, but David came convinced me, oh, let's look at this receptor as well. I said, this must be some bullshit. I mean, why should this disease affect so many different receptors? Even worse, all of them are cardiovascular. So the nature cannot be so mean. Yes, the nature is pretty mean. Look, <laughs> this process affects angiotensin receptors. What do they do? Do you know? They work with blood pressure, with uh, vessel tone. So blocking them makes the vessel dilate. It's not so good, especially if there are peripheral vessels like on the, on the, on the venous side. So, um, this is now the whole story. I know that many of you used a service called Cell Trend to identify autoantibodies in POTS patients. Because this uh, company promotes itself as having a POTS kit or POTS uh, series of tests. I know some of you did it. And this is on the left side. And you can see the receptors are limped on some surface. I don't know what the surface is. But there is no response, no cellular response, no signal from the cell. They are just limped, and you can put in another uh, antibody on top of the antibody that got limped on the surface. You can put another antibody that makes some signal that you can detect. This is how you detect higher activity of the antibody in the serum. And using this test kit, if you look at it, so uh, uh, it was a black group from uh, uh, Toledo tested this test kit on his POTS patients, and what he found was that 90% of POTS patients demonstrated increased activity for alpha-1 receptor. I will get, get back to this receptor in a few minutes. But the question is, why, why, did, uh, other receptors, uh, show, uh, why didn't other receptors show any activity? It's quite interesting, because in the cell-based assay, they showed activity in David Kemp's uh, experience, experiment. Can you see it? There's a difference. Why? So we, we don't really know the answer yet. We're going to have the answer. 
Not now. And in the muscarinic, on the muscarinic side, in the parasympathetic side receptors, receptor group. So you see that only muscarinic 4 receptor responded positively. Does it make so much sense? Um, M2 is, respon is responsible for heart rate, not M4, as far as I know. Okay, so uh, we decided to give it a try. So we had a sponsor who bought a few cell lines with alpha, beta, muscarinic receptors, and even we, we bought nociceptin receptor, which was promoted by another guy from Berlin, Gerd Valukat, who thinks that pain in pots is mediated through nociceptin receptor. So we bought one. They, had it. they didn't have it, actually. What happened was that we asked them if they had this receptor. Uh, we can, the, the company that makes the cells. Oh, we can, we can find this receptor. Can you make it for us? No problem. We can deliver any cell line with any receptor you like. So this is how it works for pharma company, actually. So we bought these four, or actually four, or five lines. I will show you the result for four lines, four cell lines. It works like that. You have this, you have this receptor and the, uh, attached to the, or just uh, uh, being anchored in the cell membrane. You put serum on it, and you see what happens if the cell responds through action on the specific receptor. And we compared the data of control patient, age and uh, sex, should I say gender, sex matched controls with POTS patients. And you see the different difference was significant for any receptor we check. These are G protein couple receptors, specific rhodopsin family of G protein couple receptors, this specific family. So, so far so good. There's a difference, you see the difference, I see the difference. So, when we put it into, in, into uh, rock curves, so uh, every cell line, every receptor performed pretty good, around 0.8. This is very good. If, when we match the results of four receptors, we ended up with 0.9 around the curve, which is very nice. So you, probably using this test, you may say, without testing patients, that nine <coughs> among 10 patients have POTS. And then it's, it's, it would be confirmed by tilt testing. So just putting it another way, way around. This is very good. This is not published yet. And another, in, an, uh, in another uh, step, what we did, we looked whether activity against different receptors corresponds to the symptoms that patients usually report in POTS. And do you remember this alpha-1 receptor from uh, the Grab study I showed you? The staple, this very high staple for one receptor, do you remember? So now, this one, this guy, alpha-1, was pretty impressive. So patients who have high activity against alpha-1 receptor have more symptoms than patients who didn't have so high activity. They had increased activity, but you, can, you may have no activity, increased activity, and you may have very high activity against alpha-1 receptor, as you can see here. So the, when activity was above the median in this group, the, these uh, patients demonstrated more symptoms, orthostatic hypotension questionnaire symptoms, which is uh, 10 different symptoms, some of them like uh, walking for a long time, standing for a long time, walking for a short time, and, and so on, uh, or headache, and so on. But in, on average, they have more symptoms. They had more symptoms than the patients who had low activity against alpha-1 receptor. Did you get it, or should I put it another way? So let's say these guys have high activity, these guys have high activity. So these guys have more symptoms, to put it simply. And specifically, it was very much expressed in terms of standing for a long time. Bingo. Is it logical? Do you know what alpha adrenergic receptors do? So Satish talked about one drug against uh, or stimulating alpha-1 receptors, which he uses against POTS, mitodrine. So mitodrine works against this blockade or 
blocking activity or stimulating activity. If they are stimulated, they cannot work properly. Okay, now, what to do? It's not that easy, as you can guess. Otherwise, we wouldn't be sitting here and discussing it. So, steroids, doesn't, they do not seem to work in POTS. Some of you may have tried uh, IVIG or subcutaneous uh, IG or MAPTERA in Norway, plasma pheresis, immune absorption, you have tried probably, and epitope mimetic peptide inhibitors. I will uh, come back to it in a few uh, minutes. So, but this is the most, one of the most important rules in medicine to keep in mind is that we shouldn't harm the patient trying to solve the problem. And it should be kept in mind when trying different immunotherapies and different options. The treatment shouldn't be worse than disease. And it is very relevant for different uh, immunotherapies. So uh, start, let's, let's start with IVIG, which is very popular. Um, so how many of you have ordered IVIG or uh, have uh, met patients who have tried IVIG? Okay, so what is your experience? Does it work? 0.5 Yeah, I have mixed feelings actually. Some people uh, report some uh, improvement and then I don't know. There, there are no randomized control studies. So we don't know. They may say what they like. They may feel better. But actually, we don't know. Some people just report they feel better. But there's no hard proof for it. What, they, what this IVIG does in the body is that it blocks different receptors, immune receptors or anti antibody receptors in different locations. But in the end, what we are just trying, what we are pursuing is to, uh, is to block the production of outer antibodies that make, hypothetically, that make damage to the body. So this is the end station of the process. To provide so much of this stuff, IV, uh, I mean I, uh, immunoglobulins, that they create a sort of uh, abundant state in the body, so the body stops producing own antibodies. Then you have uh, this uh, drug, Maptera, which is also accidentally an, auto, uh, an antibody. What it does, it attacks a specific receptor on the surface of B cells, CD20+, plus, plus, uh, uh, 20, and uh, you see B cells with CD20+, plus sign, which means that this cells have this marker on the surface. And what's happening is that rituximab <coughs> takes them out. Depletion, B cells depletion. So B cells, which normally produce out antibodies, they get removed. So it, how, it is how it works. The warning sign, there was a study in uh, chronic fatigue uh, syndrome patients in Norway they tested it on these patients, it didn't work. But the question is whether they tested, whether the, the patients had uh, out antibodies. They didn't. It just took anybody who just <laughs> applied for the therapy. So we, we, we're going to come back to this issue in the end. Then you have this uh, method, plasma for this, plasma exchange, immune absorption, and it, it used to work quite nicely if you just uh, remove antibodies, you perform plasma exchange, or just you have a column catching specifically antibodies, so you remove them, and people might feel better. In this kidney disease, it may, feel, it may work very nicely. And there are some, I have one patient who decided to do it in Germany, she says she feels perfect now. I don't know. I didn't perform the study, but again, randomized control study does, do not exist as yet. There's a warning sign from my colleague Jonas Axelsson from Stockholm, from Karolinska Stockholm. He, this is his warning sign. 
removal of agonistic G-protein kappa receptors antibodies in chronic fatigue syndrome did not attenuate symptoms in this study. You can look for this study. There was no change. They were removed. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure, but I think that Cell Trend produced the test kits for this study. So they see the removal of the antibodies, but there was no improvement in symptoms. This is a very important point. So there's no guarantee we get, get rid of this and then people will get healthy. There's no guarantee unless we perform a good study. And uh, in the end, uh, it was just published a month ago by David Kem again, notorious David Kem, his group, decoy peptides. What it is that you mimic epitopes on the, you see the loops, there's a loop, there are different amino acids, and you have epitopes, a group of three, and you think that, you believe that antibodies is looking like a dog that's looking for this specific epitope. So you find it out, you produce uh, just epitope, you infuse the epitope into the body, not to the patients, for the rabbits. <laughs> I love animals. I, I don't really like this study, uh, but I think, I think there's no way, so you have to do it once. So what they do, they infuse these decoys, peptides, mimicking uh, sequences, I mean, acid sequences on the loop of the receptor, trying to catch the antibodies from the circulation and to remove them. Very tricky method. Don't you think so? This is very, very nice, very tricky, very, very uh, precise method to get rid of the autoantibodies. And, again, these are not humans. Don't call him <laughs> for decoys. Don't order decoy peptides from him yet. <laughs> so this is for rabbits. So what you see here is that treating with decoids decrease the uh, immunologically mediated heart rate increase. Do you know what they did for, to increase the heart rate in uh, rabbits? They tilted them. They tilted the rabbits. I, I asked him, how did you do? Oh, it, there's a method for it. <laughs> I can't imagine it. So they tilted. They did head up tilters on rabbits. So there was a heart rate increase, just like in pots, almost. Oh, <laughs> this is change in heart. This is not the absolute heart rate. This is change, 120. Can you imagine what the heart rate is in rabbit? Much higher than men, in, in human. And it was removed by uh, deploying uh, decoy peptides. And you can see on this diagram that uh, the activity of the uh, immunologically mediated hyperactivity of B1 adrenergic receptor was decreased by administering this decoy peptide. So, quick fix, it works in rabbits in tilted rabbits. <laughs> so, where do we go from here? This is my best guess now. This is my proposal. You, you don't need to agree with it, but this is when, where we ended up, just um, me thinking about this presentation. Head-to-head -head comparison of different antibody detection methods is mandatory. Without it, we cannot identify who the responder will. We're just using Kalashnikov to hit the target. It may work, but this is not a very nice method. Why? You can shoot the innocent as well. So, cell-based or any other method which is good, reliable, reproducible. Second point, we have to look at the Immune system. What's wrong with the immune system? What part of the system uh, do not work properly? And trying to repair it. And try to, to understand whether there is some genetic susceptibility. So we, we can find which, who, who is susceptible to POTS. To maybe to find a way to prevent immun, immunological stimulation, immun, immune triggers 
like some vaccinations. Probably some people may be very sensitive to this process as well. And the third point is that immune testing for ports is mandatory, but without it, we cannot get on the adventure of testing different immunotherapies like, like IVIG, Mapthera, plasmapheresis, immunoabsorption, or decoy peptides. So first, good testing, good characterization, then identifying appropriate candidates for treatment, and then performing randomized control studies. There's no other way. So I would like to thank you for your attention.